Yeah, when, when you're young, you can basically eat uh, an ice cream and you grow strong. Or you can just look at a piece of meat and, and you gain muscle. When you become older, you have to go out of your way to ingest your protein. So if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't uh, do some sort of exercise or strength training or whatever, your body decides that you don't need that much muscle. You're going to have to be tracking something. I'd rather you track your macros, not really ketones, right? We call that false ketosis. I can put ketones in my body, it doesn't mean that I'm producing them. You are really in ketosis if you produce those ketones yourself, right? They go with a simple is better and you're gonna get like 90% of the results that you want by doing um, the, the fewest thing possible. You're on a diet, not on a culinary tour. So just stick to basics, get like- Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body, Mind, Empowerment podcast. I'm your host, Simland, and our guest today is Louise Ilassenois. Louise is known as Darth Luigi Online, and he's the founder of the Keto Gain subreddit and website. He's been doing the ketogenic diet for nearly 18 years, if I'm correct, and he's successfully built an amazing physique with it. So, Louise, I want to welcome you to the show, and I'm glad to have you here. Thank you, Sim, for having me. Yeah, I think like you're really, really one of the living legends of the ketogenic diet because there really isn't anyone else who has been doing this for so long. So how long has it actually been? Yeah, it's, uh, you got it right. About 18 years now, uh, consist consistently. Of course, uh, people always ask me if I haven't eaten a carb in 18 years. Of course, uh, I do have uh, like some deviations. It's normal. It's very much like someone who is not doing keto will probably do keto five, six days uh, in a year. I also go out of keto on average, I'd say five, six days in a year, and very much on purpose. Like I want to eat some chocolate cake or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like if the occasion really is uh, worth it, I may, got, may go out of keto for a meal, basically. Not really, it's not something that I go for a whole week, just for a single meal. Yeah, yeah. but you still kind of maintain, let's say, a state of nutritional ketosis almost all the time, basically. Exactly. Yeah, that's basically my way of life. Mm, that's cool. So what got you what got you into ketosis? Uh, very much I did it at first without knowing that it was actually ketosis. I was more so trying to follow a classic bodybuilding cutting diet, which uh, as most people already know is just uh, eating super low carb in the way that you don't eat starches, you eat lots of green vegetables, you eat uh, protein, basically uh, broccoli and chicken rice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no, no rice, just <laughs> broccoli and chicken. Yeah. Uh, trying to find out uh, more, more the science behind it. And I started reading uh, about the ins and outs, uh, the, ins, the, the whys and hows. And I started a little bit of research on internet. At the time, we didn't have Reddit. And so I'm talking about late uh, 1999, uh, 2000. Mm -hmm. And um, there were bulletin boards, and there was a bulletin board regarding uh, bodybuilding. And there was one particular, I don't even remember the name, it was very much like IRCC chat, where even Lyle McDonald participated. So at the time he was finishing, or had just finished his book, uh, The Ketogenic Diet, and uh, I re remember that someone pointed me to that book, which was very basically the Bible or in my heart, it's the Bible of a ketogenic diet for recomposition purposes. Mm -hmm. And that basically that's what got me into keto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, you, you're so correct in the sense that keto has become very popular within the last few years only. And before that, you really had to dig very deep into finding out the information of how to do it. And uh, if exactly. people, people were even skeptical about uh, whether or not you can build muscle and when you showed up in the scene of whoa, I've been doing it for you know like 12 years and the people were like okay maybe maybe there is something there that can actually work so how did you see your performance change after the first uh, periods of starting keto uh, it's it's quite funny even like uh, because I didn't really start with um, with like, some precognition or preconceptions for me it was a very natural process what I see normally is People, for example, who are bodybuilding or strength training or doing performance type sports hear about keto 
about a, a fat loss diet or, or the magic cutting diet that normally you hear right now, how it's been popularized, right? To lose yeah. fat quickly. So, but they also hear the negatives of it, that you're going to lose strength and power. So they come already with this mindset. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Whereas in my case, I was already sort of doing a low-carb diet. I always eating a, sort of a paleo protocol. Uh, from my grandfather's side of the family, he's like, he's a hunter. And he's also... Um, a farmer in a way he loves to do things uh, for himself as a hobby so he goes and hunts as a hobby he uh plants the food he eats as a hobby so every time i went and visited him that also got into my mother's uh, how she cooks and everything so we always in my house ate it like sort of paleo style so for me the transition was not very hard in that sense uh i also prefer like a uh, to eat eggs, meats, uh, some cheese, uh, but uh, mostly green vegetables. So I didn't really feel that much of a difference because I'm, I was never a super high carb person, right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, it didn't really hit me that hard because uh, I never carved up. Yeah. At the start of the diet, of course, uh, I read the recommended protocol that it's in the book that it's a cyclical ketogenic diet, which is what some bodybuilders do that it that entails carving up every weekend, for example. And I started following that protocol. I started doing a cyclical ketogenic diet. And actually what I found is that every time that I did the carb load, I felt lethargic, tired, bloated. So it was a feeling that I didn't like, but I had to do it because the book said that I had to do it, that I needed the carbs and the glucose to actually build muscle. Uh, I never liked the feeling. Uh, I, it, I, when I transitioned to the carb load, of course, then I felt tired and sluggish, etc. And then when I transitioned back into keto, that's when I felt energetic. So yeah, maybe I lifted a little bit more when I had more carbs in, but probably also due to the calories and you know the extra calories ingested, etc. But again, it's something that I didn't like. So what happened in my case is that I started to um, space more the carb loads. First, it was, I was doing them every week as the book suggested then. Then uh, I was doing them probably every two weeks, then every like once a month. Then I probably just forgot about it. And I said, I, I don't really need them. I'm not lifting more with carbs. I'm uh, performing great without them. I'm doing feel tired, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with some adjustments that I did. And also, of course, another version of uh, the carb load, which is called uh, targeted ketogenic diet, which is the one I, <clears throat> I really use and I suggest to some clients which is basically just adding a few extra carbs before training. And when I see it say few, I'd say between five up to 15 for average persons. Some high-end athletes may, of course, need a little bit more or much more, depending on the type of uh, sports and uh, duration of it. But again, uh, I felt that I really didn't need them and my performance really didn't suffer. Uh, so I just decided to not add them any, in any way. Yeah, I, I, I was similar in your case as well. Like, I did start off with regular keto, then I did the cyclical version, and I did also agree that although the carb ups are, you know, you get to consume a massive amounts of carbohydrates and calories while still losing body fat, but at the same time you do feel slightly sluggish, and uh, your performance may may actually suffer because of that. So yeah, they, those carb ups they tend to get boring after a while, after you kind of satisfy yourself. I haven't had a carb since 2004. When did you start the Keto Jane's uh, subreddit? Um, that was around 2006, 200 and, sorry, 2006 to 2007. And it was very much because <clears throat> I frequented Reddit and I found that there was a keto board. So, I found out that there were some people interested in actually doing a ketogenic diet for strength training, bodybuilding, and they were giving lots of uh, either incorrect or conflicting advice. So I was very shy at first. I didn't like to post, uh, I like even less like probably I, I didn't. I wasn't sure that I even myself knew what I was doing. It was just my N one experience that sort of went by what the book suggested some little things against what uh, Lyle McDonald suggested. Uh, but again, it was just my N1 experience. 
So after just commenting and helping some people and people started to get results with my suggestions, uh, uh, the, the moderators of the board made me a mod as well. So I started helping more people officially. Yeah. But what happened also was that my advice was sometimes a little bit conflicting to the regular ketogenic advice because I uh, suggested people to eat a little bit more protein to not use percentages, rather use uh, grams in accordance to lean weight and uh, the, the objectives and the context of the people, etc. So again, if you see what I'm talking about, it went a little bit against what most people understood or understand what a ketogenic diet is, right? Uh, following the ketogenic ratio, um, going, uh, not going high on protein, etc. Yeah. So <laughs> what then we decided to do is uh, that they banished me to yeah. another forum <laughs> <laughs> so that it was like the advanced version of uh, keto that was not going to confuse the newbies or people okay. who, were, who, who came, right, to avoid confusion. So we decided to say, go and create another forum where it's more uh, <laughs> for people who want to strength train and then you can use your own protocol there and uh, so we don't confuse people. So that's how Keto Games was born. Nice, nice. I went, I, I created Keto Gains, and what I started to do is because people always ask me the same questions, I decided to create like the fact, like a wiki where you already have the pre answered uh, most basic questions. And as always, uh, this is something, an anecdote I like to tell people always question me. And I, at the time, there were some answers I didn't know the correct answer to. So I like uh, got angry and went and researched because I should have the answer or should have a good theory of why this is happening or whatever. I, I cannot say something if I myself am not sure about at least have a congruent hypothesis that makes sense and that is supported by science because I am a nerd as well. So I need to know uh, something. I, I cannot make things up. It doesn't go well by my ethics. So I started researching, buying books, uh, asking some uh, pro trainers or some uh, like uh, doctors, even in some cases, I started to get, uh, you know, uh, try to know people in the circles, not only on keto, but also people that are against keto to get all the versions. And that's how the, the science-based aspect of keto games was born. That's also something we strive and we are very proud, uh, proud of. We always try to get uh, everything evidence-based with uh, actual hypotheses or the uh, pros and cons of doing something. So because we understand that a ketogenic diet is not a panacea, it's not mm -hmm. the, the best diet for everyone. Like yeah. some, some people will do, will do very well on a ketogenic diet. Some people will do ho probably horribly wrong. But what we know is that the main, um, let's say, uh, success from all diets if you are a vegan if you do paleo you do high carb is uh in most of them uh the the thing they have in common is eating whole foods eating an adequate amount of protein and in somehow in their way being man mindful of energy requirements mm. so yeah basically yeah there are definitely many different ways of doing keto and a therapeutic ketosis isn't necessarily ideal for someone trying to build muscle and uh, gain strength. So, yeah, you definitely exactly. have yeah. you definitely have kind of dissected yourself as a different way of doing keto. So, what does what the, what are like some of the differences between a regular keto diet and a keto gains diet in terms of like macronutrient ratios? So, the the first thing is that we don't use ratios. That's a word that is forbidden because. Our body really doesn't use percentages. Yeah. Our body has uh, certain needs that are more so uh, in relation to weight. And that's how actually uh, science does it. Yeah, normally you will find, if you look at studies, uh, you will find that when they talk about keto, of keto in percentages, but newer studies do accept that the requirement uh, needs of macronutrients are based ba uh, based on weight of the person especially protein right mm. uh, because we cater to body recomposition we ourselves prefer to use lean amount of weight so we go by very much even though people say that we are super high protein 
If you look at our actual recommendations, they are very in line with what uh, Dr. Fini and Bollock, uh, some of the, as you know, the lead researchers on ketogenic diets, mm -hmm. that's very much what, what they suggest, about 0.8 grams of pound of, uh, sorry, of protein per lean pound a person weights. So they are very much in line with what they suggest. Uh, if you do a lot of strength training, uh, we be on the safe side and we recommend people to probably increase to one gram of protein per lean weight, uh, uh, per, sorry, per lean pound they weight, but that's about it. We don't really suggest people going higher. So I don't know why, why some uh, people think that we are super high protein. That's actually quite less than the uh, suggested recommendations in most uh, strength training uh, research, etc. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, then for carbs, it really much depends on the person. Uh, for someone starting a ketogenic diet, we probably suggest to stay between 20 up to 30 uh, grams of net carbohydrates and to prefer uh, vegetables, especially green, because those are super fibrous. They will really not have that uh, higher amount of carbs. They are not starches and they are the most nutrient dense. We advocate also nutrient density. Uh, yeah, macros are important, but also micronutrients as well, vitamins, minerals, electrolytes. And if you um, prefer green vegetables, there's a base, uh, likely you will not be missing on the most important ones. So you don't really have to go out of, out of, out of your way to supplement. And then fat, we tend to say that fat is a lever. Fat should be very much in accordance to your main goals and context at the time. Like if you want to maintain weight, of course you're going to have to eat uh, or you need a, uh, more energy, so you need to eat more fat. If you're do someone who is doing lots of exercise, probably you need to eat, go even more and increase higher. And if you want to lose body fat, calorie balance, it does matter on keto, even though some, do, some people say it may not. You actually have to reduce your energy intake for a while, especially um, the, uh, so you want to burn your own body fat. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's, the, that's the main difference. It's uh, we're not stuck in percentages because yeah. we really are, are not uh, aiming for you know brain health or so the therapeutic approach of keto. What we want is optimal body composition. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely. Like I, I feel as well. Like the reason why people say that you are high protein or they're afraid of this protein is that is because of the ratios themselves. Like um, when you look at it, then uh, like I mentioned, the actual amount of protein consumed isn't high in relation to let's say some other high protein diets or something. So it's still yeah. rel relatively low. And uh, there's also confusion that. Uh, like uh, ketones have to be super high. And uh, what we found, especially among people who have been doing keto for quite long, uh, for example, my case, uh, you look at Rob Wolf, Mark Sisson, uh, who are fit, who do uh, lots of uh, exercise in one way or another, is that as you go along and your body becomes more adapted to the use of ketones, you actually have less ketones in your blood at any given time. It doesn't matter if you go super high protein, if I go out of my way and consume only protein for a few days, or if I fast for two or three days, my ketone levels will be very much, in my case, mm -hmm. at about, for example, uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. I rarely go over 0 0.8. And again, Mark Sisson has found the same, Rob Wolf, Alessandro Ferretti, lots of researchers or people who advocate a ketogenic diet, it's very much the same. And the reason that, or our hypothesis is very much because uh, your body becomes more efficient at using ketones. So at any given time, ketones are a fuel source. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're basically using them, producing them and using them at a constant rate so they don't accumulate. On mm -hmm. people who are new to a ketogenic diet, because their body is not that efficient as using that kind of fuel yet, they tend to accumulate. Also, probably if, they, you, if you have a higher body fat percentage, plus if you consume uh, even a higher amount of uh, dietary fat, then probably you can increase the rate of uh, ket uh, ketones you produce, again, because you are ingesting a lot of uh, uh, dietary fat, or probably you have a higher body fat to burn. But people who are, again, who have been doing that this for quite a while, who have a normal low body fat percentage and that don't, yeah, ingest a lot of dietary fat, tend to have lower levels of ketones.
yeah, yeah totally like if you have low levels of body fat then you're going to have lower amounts of ketones in your blood because you're not exactly. you're not your your liver isn't producing them that much and you're more efficient with that's that's quite good and also like it goes exactly. against it goes against you know a lot of people on social media they're posting of how high their ketones are or they're so proud of it but at the same time like ketones themselves don't necessarily mean that you're keto adapted they may they simply show that there are some ketones in your blood but how well you're exactly gonna, yeah yeah how well you're going to use them we, we call it that uh we call that false ketosis i can put ketones in my body it doesn't mean that i'm producing them yeah. so really i'm not in, like it's different to or what i what i would say is you are really in ketosis if you produce those ketones yourself right if I go out of my way and uh, consume exogenous ketones, yeah, they will probably do something like give me energy, but those are not my ketones. I just borrow them. Mm. So I'm really not in ketosis. I'm uh, like, a, I put ketones in my body, but th those are not my ketones, yeah. right? Yeah. So in the case, for example, of um, losing body fat, it, it, it's not optimal mm. because yeah, the ketones probably will help you with uh, hunger, uh, they probably will help you with electrolytes because usually they, they come with an electrolyte formula. They will give me energy, of course. They are a source of energy, but they will not mean that I'm burning more body fat. Right, right. In the other hand, if I produce those ketones from my own body fat, then, of course, I'm losing body fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's definitely. <laughs> and uh, have you tried maybe using the breath meter? Have you seen any differences with that? Yeah, but again, uh, it's something that doesn't work very well in my case. I've had like three uh, breathalyzers. Uh, the, uh, basically, the first, the uh, middle and the latest version of Ketonix, I use it uh, not daily. But what I found in my case, for example, if I, I have higher ketone numbers after I have a fatty meal or after I do strength training. Very much because it's supposed to be like that. If I ingest uh, high fat, I burn a little bit of it afterwards. If I do some exercise, then my body is uh, producing ketones as energy. So that's uh, also why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. First, we render fat. Let's maybe talk about protein in more in more closer detail. Like um, yeah. people think that you know protein is going to turn into sugar and gluconeogenesis is like the F word of keto. So. What do you think about that? Uh, so here's the deal. People think that protein is only used for muscles. Normally, that's uh, when, when I tell someone to add some protein to their diet, especially when they report their numbers and I see that they're ingesting uh, 30, 40 grams a day and we're talking about uh, an adult. Uh, they are afraid of it because they think they're going to skew the ketogenic that ratio and then basically that means that they are all the protein, all the extra protein they eat above that certain percentage is going to magically turn into glucose, and then they're gonna get fat. And it really doesn't happen that way. You, you're gonna gain weight if your caloric intake is over a certain amount. Uh, it doesn't matter if you basically eat 30 or 50 grams of carbs. Yes, I know about the insulin hypothesis, but again, it's an hypothesis, and you can lose weight eating 100 grams. Of a uh, sorry, a hundred percentage of your intake if you avoid carbs if you're still on a caloric deficit. Mm. So some people yeah are insulin resistant, and for them keto is going to be uh, a better way to lose body fat. They're gonna feel better with it, probably not hungry, and that for myself also uh, one of the best advantages of doing keto that like, uh, be, being not so hungry because hungry will happen even if you're on ketosis. But again, uh, most people will experience a reduction in hunger. So if you ingest, uh, like I was saying that protein is really not only used for muscles. Protein is also used for uh, hormones, enzymes. Uh, a lot of uh, bodily functions require protein, your bones, your skin. So people forget about that. We are basically, or human beings are a bag of proteins. So it's not just for muscle, it's for all your body. And you require a certain amount on a daily basis because your body can store uh, glucose as glycogen in your muscles and your liver. And your body will always require glucose and then that's why you have gluconeogenesis, right? Your body can store uh, fat, that's why you become overweight.
and you require fat again also for some uh, as for its energy stored and also for uh, some uh, functions of your metabolism but your body really cannot store uh, protein or amino acids uh, the only way you store protein is in your muscles and because your body does require glucose and does require cell turnover and repair what your body does is it basically takes out amino acids from your muscles if you don't uh, give a, or if it has a certain amount and even though you may require a little bit less protein when you are on a ketogenic diet because a ketogenic diet tends to be muscle sparing it can only be so much muscle sparing you need a minimal amount and uh, that minimal amount, is what we go for is very much what Dr. Finney and Bullock suggest, which is uh, the point, they actually suggest like 0.75 or something, but we round that a little bit just for convenience. Hmm. And that's why we suggest uh, 0.8 grams per lean pound a person weight. Why lean pound? Because you don't want to feed your fat, right? Like it's not the same if you say someone that weights uh, 300 pounds, you're not going to give that person probably uh, 200 uh, grams of protein. Probably that person only ha needs, uh, let's say, 150, uh, 150 or 120, depending on the actual amount of body fat. It's not that much protein. And uh, protein should be set, again, in grams, and then it's in stone. If you look at this in percentages, probably then it can be higher than the 25 that most people strive for when they use ratios. It could be probably 30 or 45. But it doesn't mean that once it goes out of the ratio, it will magically turn into glucose. Hmm. The body makes glu glucose as it needs. So again, probably, and this is something that even Menno Henselman uh, says, uh, it's, it's a suggestion from him, is basically if... Uh, as we know, there there is a certain amount of protein that tends to become uh, glucose. As we know, it's about 45% of protein can be transformed into glucose, right? Mm -hmm. It's a uh, 60. Uh, it's 55, 60 uh, anti uh, uh, gluconeogenic and about 40, 45 gluconeogenic. Mm -hmm. This is because some of the amino acids that compose protein can be transform into glucose and some others cannot not all protein by itself will be transformed into glucose only about 40 percent but it doesn't happen that just because you eat one gram of protein 40 percent of it will be transformed into glucose it, it is not like that it's to put it in an easy way to understand let's think that maybe only 40 percent of the protein you eat above your daily requirements can have a chance of being transformed into glucose. So a very easy way to actually calculate this would be to just use, use uh, the 0.8 grams per lean pound you weight, and then any amount of protein that you consume over that, you multiply that, it can be counted toward your daily carbohydrate intake. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so if you actually look at the, those numbers, most people could be consuming, uh, let's say, 120 grams of protein a day, which would be very much the optimal for building uh, lean mass. And even if they ingested a little bit more, they would still be accounting that protein towards carbs at around 40, 50 grams of net carbs a day. Mm -hmm considering they were ingesting 20 to 25. And going over 30 grams of carbohydrates a day doesn't kick you out of ketosis. You require probably 20 to 30 to enter ketosis. Once you're adapted, and also depending if you don't do exercise, most people can stay in ketosis between 40 to 50 grams. Why? Because your body uses uh, your brain at least 30 grams a day for brain function. You will burn a little bit of it uh, when you exercise, walk, etc. It, and if you, the rest of all your carbohydrates come from green vegetables, all of it will be used like a, you're not going to be consuming it just in one bowl. It will be mm -hmm. throughout the day. So you have lots of time to, to run it. It really won't affect negatively either ketosis nor body composition. Large amounts of those amino acids that the body needs daily. So I hope, I, I hope that, that explanation made sense because it's a little bit hard to follow around. But the thing is, 
as long as you're eating, uh, like let's say, 250 grams of protein a day in relation to your own uh, body weight, I don't think it's really going to hinder or reduce, importantly, the rate of ketosis or it's something that you have to worry about for fat loss. And this is something that I've done with lots of clients. I really never suggest to people to uh, obsess about ketone numbers because mm -hmm. they tend to do so. And then, uh, like, if you're going to be tracking something, I'd rather you track your macros, not really ketones, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when your goal is uh, to lose body fat or to become stronger, etc. But I've had clients that are eating more protein than myself, uh, like 180 grams or even 200 grams a day, and they have super high ketone numbers. So mm -hmm. it's really because they're losing a lot of body fat. Again, body fat, when you burn it, produce ket produces ketones, right? Mm -hmm. And they are totally out of the, of the ketogenic ratio numbers. Uh, in my case, I normally, people probably think that I ingest a lot of protein. My average would be 135, uh, 100, uh, 100, uh, 140. Some days I may ingest probably 160, but the average is about 140 grams a day. That's not that much for someone my weight and size and activity level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Like, uh, so, so it basically means that uh, most people aren't actually consuming enough protein on keto. Especially women and especially uh, people who are over 35. Mm -hmm. There's also, a, and, and the trend for me is very worrying because uh, a lot of people, especially for example, our clients are uh, over 35 and uh, in average 40. And uh, if you, you know the word sarcopenia, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Sarcopenia, for those that are hearing and are not familiar with it, it uh, basically means how you lose lean mass as you age. It's, a, it's called age-related sarcopenia. And this happens mainly for two reasons. One, because you are not really exercising that much and the body is very efficient at what it needs or what it doesn't. So if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't do some sort of exercise or strength training or whatever, your body decides that you don't need that much muscle. So basically, it reduces it and uses those uh, amino acids for other functions. And then the second one is because as you age, you become leucine resistant. Mm. Very much like you become insulin resistant or you can become insulin resistant, you can become leucine resistant. This is a normal process and uh, leucine is a master signaler to build muscle or to uh, increase lean mass. It's very much like a switch. Mm. So by ingesting the protein, uh, you turn on the levels in signal or the, yeah, the master switch to uh, give your body the uh, signal to start building lean mass. Mm. As we age, we become leucine resistant and we need more leucine to build the muscle. Right. So uh, let, let's say that 100 grams on average, uh, more so let's uh, go like this, like uh, on average, uh, 25, 30 grams of uh, any kind of uh, animal protein usually has about two to three grams of leucine. It has been found in studies that about two grams of leucine is what your body actually needs to turn on the muscle protein signal, right? Mm -hmm. Synthesis. As we age and we become more leucine resistant, we don't need that anymore too. We may need uh, three or four or five grams of leucine. So we actually need to ingest more protein to uh, turn on the, the muscle protein synthesis. Right. So that's one of the reasons why I'm really a little bit uh, worried about some of the protein recommendations that I see people giving, especially if you are over 35. You want to maintain muscle, not just to become muscular, because a muscle is your health pension as you age. What happens when you are old and you fall? You can break some bones. The more muscle you have, uh, uh, it's like a question. And also you will be able to do or be as, uh, do the same things that you're doing now when you're 25 or 35, if you have more muscle when you are 60 or 70. There's no reason, or in my case, I view it like this, uh, why the hell do I want to live up to 90 years if I'm going to be wheelchair bound? Mm. I'd rather live to 80 or 75, but being able to feel, uh, to live my life fully and do all the things that I'm doing right now, um, and, and not be like sitting on a chair and need to have a nurse that wipes my ass, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Like uh, definitely, most of the age-related diseases, 
like uh, let's say cardiovascular diseases and uh, mobility issues and uh, joint issues they're all related to sarcopenia as well and exactly it's it's actually more important to keep exercising and to keep doing resistance training and eating enough protein as you age more so than you're young because you're more fragile in a sense you're becoming more fragile at your age yeah when, when you're young you can basically eat uh, an ice cream and you grow strong you, or you can just look at a piece of meat and and you gain muscle when you become older you have to go out of your way to ingest your protein and it's very funny but uh, i don't know if it's something that you've seen with your parents i've seen i see it with mine all the time and with clients when i ask it's very much the same uh you know our parents and it had will happen to all of us eventually and our grandfathers if you look at them on a daily basis they tend to eat less and less uh, uh, animal based products mm. it's very much because they're not hungry for them or uh, like they lose their appetite mm. they will always want to eat that bread or that piece of cake or etc uh, so their appetite for meat becomes smaller I don't know why there's that's something that I'm actually quite curious uh, probably it's habits I don't know exactly the reason uh, but again, they, your body becomes resistant to leucine. You become less active. You eat less protein. So it's like, a, again, a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. where you are yourself letting go, right? Yeah. Like, let your, you let yeah. yourself go into that state. Yeah. Whereas if you see some uh, active athletes, even at their old age, who actively monitor their protein intake, their exercise, etc., like, for example, Frank Sane, uh, who was a famous bodybuilder, or is a famous bodybuilder, or some other uh, older athletes who do uh, even triathlons or who are sprinters or whatever, even at their 60 years, they have, of course, not the same physique as when they were 30, but they have maintained a very, uh, like, a, they have maintained at 80% of their body by monitoring their whole foods and probably with a ketogenic approach, I'm sure this can be even improved. Come with me if you want to lift. Mm, yeah, I totally agree, right? Like um, thinking that aging is an excuse or thinking that aging is inevitable is also like a very self-fulfilling prophecy as well. Like, is it because people have lower growth hormone as they age because of the age or is it because they're not exercising enough you know, like there's this difference between having lower growth hormone and lower uh, muscle protein synthesis because of being older or because of not exercising or not stimulating those hormones. So it, exactly. Like potentially. Yeah. If and it makes sense. Like from an evolutionary perspective, uh, those people have probably already done their work. They've already uh, uh, procreated they already make sense because they have already procreated they already done their job so it's time for yeah. them to yeah. go to their second function would we be taking care of the uh, grandchildren or you know doing other things right. but again if you actually eat adequately keep doing some kind of strength training uh, keep active again use it or lose it you keep using it then you're telling your body <laughs> you still want it yeah, so yeah. the body it will okay will respect that and either your body the body is very wise in this aspect if you sit all day long and you just watch tv eventually you will start to lose lean mass it's more so again if you don't uh, eat properly mm -hmm. but even if you are 70 years old you just look at some people uh, or some cultures where uh, the elderly are participating and are active in the community where they still go to work and they still probably uh, you know work at, in the harvest or they also hunt etc like a, probably look at the Maasai or look at the aborigines in Australia where they the elderly are actually teaching how to hunt and they uh, participate in the hunt and you look at their bodies uh, they are still very much in uh, I, I would not say in their prime but they look very much uh, uh, like their junk peers yeah yeah that's true definitely so like uh, we've been talking about protein and such but have you paid attention to this uh, recent uh, experiment Jimmy Moore did with, uh, with uh, John Levansky of where they consume like three to one ratios of protein to fat. Well, uh, the thing in my, uh, I'm just going to say that uh, I respect Jimmy, but uh, he, that was not really an experiment. Yeah. Uh, he didn't really follow uh, Dr. Ted Naiman's protocol. Mm. That like uh, uh, he should have eaten first much less protein, not that much. Second, 
he should not have been eating that much uh, body fat, super birth, sorry, a dietary fat. Uh, like, uh, again, I don't think that was a very well done experiment. Mm. Uh, uh, that's probably my main thought in, in that regard. Mm, yeah, like probably. if you, if we actually, yeah, like, and again, depending on what the context of, uh, or what's the purpose of you doing that? If you do it, uh, like, if there is a crash diet that actually works for, I'd say, 95% of the population and the other 5%, it doesn't work to do adherence issues, is what it's called a PSMF protocol, which is a protein spring modified fast, where you basically just eat protein and some uh, vegetables. Mm -hmm. And this is both a bodybuilding approach and um, a therapeutic approach. It is used widely on um, gastric bypass doctors where they are going to do an operation or any other uh, fat loss operation where they reduce either the, the size of your stomach or the size of your bowels, etc., where they put very overweight patients in this protocol for a few weeks prior to the operation to make them lose as much uh, uh, body fat as possible before the operation. And again, it's a very well proven a proven and tried protocol where you increase protein to a certain amount and you have the client eat uh, just uh, protein either in liquid or solid form with minimal amount of fat, uh, but do add nutrients. And this is also protein used pre-contest by bodybuilders to get to their leanest and it works for everybody. Right. So again, this is a protocol for rapid fat loss. It's not sustainable. It shouldn't be used for more than one, two weeks without a feed or without medical supervision. This is something that I even myself don't uh, put uh, my clients on. Uh, only those who actually know what they're doing, for example, the ones that are going to be doing a, a bodybuilding contest, that's something that we do with uh, constant checkups, but that's something that we don't recommend to, for people to do the, uh, like just because. Mm. Uh, but uh, um, in the case of Jimmy, like he reported some other issues regarding uh, blood glucose, etc. Uh, again, I don't think that the experiment was right. something done very well. Mm -hmm. But again. Mm -hmm. the, so the protein sparing modified fast is basically like the chicken breast and broccoli diet. In a way, or you could also do it with beef or etc. But yeah, that's a chicken breast and broccoli diet. <laughs> uh, you have to take some precautions because uh, it's very nutrient depleting in a way. Uh, and also the adherence factor is uh, horrible. Like uh, it looks on paper very easy, but once you get to the third or fourth day, it uh, becomes like a core. And then uh, what happens with a lot of people is losing fat is super slow for most people. Like, as you know, one pound of body fat is 3,500 calories. Mm -hmm. So you don't really burn, even though you are like losing one pound a day, that pound is not just body fat. It, right. It's water, it's uh, the weight of the food. There are a lot of factors. So it takes more than one week to actually lose one pound of body fat for most people. Mm -hmm. So what happens is uh, very much again, even with keto, uh, you do the diet perfectly for two or three days. By the fourth, you are tired and you go and you have a cheat meal or whatever. And so you lose all the process that you actually had <laughs> done in one week of hard work. So Either, like for, for example, with my clients, what we do is it's better slow and steady and constant fat loss rather than just go out of your way to uh, put them in a very hard diet that will really only tire them both physically and mentally and will cause some uh, binges or other issues that then they will backtrack and lose all the progress. Right, right. So what would be like the macro, let's say, what would be the uh, grams of protein you would consume on this diet? On a PSMF? Yeah. Well, it really depends, but for most people, you start at about 1.2 uh, grams of protein per lean pound, and you increase depending on uh, your level of leanness and, and uh, the deficit you're planning to do and even activity. I've seen some people even go as high as even um, 2.5 grams of protein per lean pound. So okay. in my case, if I remember correctly, because there's even a a calculator where you can sort of get your numbers. I would be consuming at about 250 grams at my highest. Right. 
my recommended amount would be about 200 grams of protein per day. And it, again, it's to actually eat that much, you have to use uh, lots of whey shakes and so because uh, most people will not be able to actually eat that mu much protein. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and this is also something, uh, now that we're talking about this, uh, when people think that uh, they have to eat lots of protein and that protein kick them out of ketosis, etc. If you actually look at what those people are eating, it's not whole foods because it's so very hard to actually eat 200 grams of protein and not the amount of protein by weight, but the protein macro. Like uh, I know, of course, there are outliers and there are people that will eat everything, but to actually get to 200, 250 grams of protein, look at the amount of food you actually have to eat. <laughs> it's quite a lot. So unless you're uh, having two or three whey shakes a day, or what I see some people uh, actually do is that they're having protein bars. Right. So yeah, one protein bar is probably 20 or 20, uh, 35 uh, grams of protein. They're having three of them. Mm. You know what's kicking you out of keto and what's reducing your ketone levels is a bar mm. by itself, not the protein. Because those bars, is, it's very much like if you were eating a sneaker or a Mars bar yeah. with extra protein, but the, the, most of the ingredients are the same. You're still getting chocolate, you're still getting some sugar or, or sugar alcohols, which do affect in at that amount, uh, probably your ketone uh, numbers, or even if it's fiber or whatever, those things for most people do affect uh, ketone levels and insulin levels, etc. So... It's not the protein. If you were eating just a beef stick or chicken, and even more so if you spaced it throughout the day, it would not happen. Mm. But again, yeah, yeah. don't and blame the, the, the protein for what the sugar or the carbs is, right? Yeah, it's like it's, it's also easier to overeat those keto-friendly meal replacement bars than it is to overeat and exactly. stick. Like the, you can basically ch 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 chum down like five bars without even blinking an eye. Well, but it's, it's much more difficult. Yeah. This is something uh, that Rob Wolf calls, um, I think it's, um, I don't remember the term, but it's like your palate gets tired of certain flavors. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, um, even, you know, eating contests, that's why the, the, you, you look at the, at the contestants, they try to change or uh, bite on different flavors so they can win and keep eating. Like, they are eating probably hot dogs and then they will munch on chocolate or something that has a different flavor so they don't get tired of the same food and can keep yeah. eating. If you put like a one kilo steak in your, in your plate, you're not going to be able to eat it. Mm -hmm. But what happens, if, even if it's the same amount of calories and the same volume of food, if you have half, of, half that amount of steak but plus some bread, plus some uh, dessert, you're going to be able to finish it all and even have space for an extra donut. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so true. Like uh, the more variety you have to choose from, the, the more you're likely to want to eat them as well, and the less you're gonna get sick of it. So, it's exactly yeah. There's still food, but I don't want to eat it. But what about fat? If you if you if we've been talking about that, people can uh, lose body fat, or they can reduce their fat intake at the expense of their body fat. So, what would be like a safe margin of how low they can go? Uh, it really depends on the person again. Um, like the lowest uh, as per studies suggested dietary fat for most people would be, if you want a certain number, it's about a, a 0.35 uh, grams of fat per pound the person weights. So at the lowest, it, it, or on average, it really boils down to about 45 grams per person. That's like a, a safe margin. Uh, but again, it really, it's something that I don't suggest. Like, it's better to lose fat on a constant, uh, slow rate so that there are a lot of uh, physiological and also psychological factors that come to mind. Otherwise, you get a classic uh, JoJo dieting, right? You probably lose uh, weight fast, but then you also regain it faster. Mm -hmm. And then over, like you go over, or you, in the end, you, re you, you don't go get to the way you were before, you probably get a little bit fatter. Right. So to avoid this, is, uh, in most cases, it's better to just have a constant, uh, slower rate of fat loss so that your body and your mind gets used to that new person, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this, there is a, like an adaptation process. It's called homeostasis. For example, in my case, I've never, 
I was never lean all my life. I was fat as a kid, then I was very thin as a teen. Like I went through a period of uh, anorexia for doing things completely wrong. But then when I, like say, let's say that I sort of um, maintained and when I started doing keto and so I maintained about a 15% body fat for quite a few years. Then I started doing things way better. And then I maintained 30%, uh, 13%, sorry. And now I can maintain without actually counting calories when I don't between 10 to 12%. Mm. But if I want to go lower for a photo shoot or whatever, I do have to count. And I've seen this happen to quite a lot of people. Like, well, you are 20% body fat and you can maintain that perfectly. Okay, let's drop down probably to 16, 50% with a diet for, I don't know, in a period of two months. Okay, now let's maintain there. And let's see how you can actually maintain with mindful eating, uh, changing habits, etc. Okay, you can maintain that, then probably we can go for another round of fat loss to get you probably to 30% or 12%. Mm-hmm. Okay, and as you go, so on and so forth. And it's much better for the person, unless again, they have a, you know, a date that they have, you know, a certain date that they have to lose a body fat. Uh, to get to a certain body fat percentage, like they want to do a bodybuilding contest or something. But otherwise, for normal people, let's say, it's better to go slower but constant. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, that's, that's yeah, very interesting because yeah, we all have like these psychological images about what kind of a body image we have of ourselves and we have to kind of change. There needs to be a psychological shift as well if, if you recomposition your body. Yes, and uh, also uh, that's something uh, very happen that happens to lots of uh, people. They, especially those that were most of their life overweight, uh, they look at themselves in the mirror and they don't recognize themselves. Mm. And also, people don't recognize themselves. And, uh, sorry, uh, the the person, and they treat them quite differently. Uh, usually for the best. But like uh, I've had some clients that that tell me everybody tells tells me I look uh, like sick right? Because they lost so much weight. But if you actually look at them, they look great. Mm. But then uh, they let themselves be like, um, how do you say it? Uh, like they, they let people get over their head yeah, yeah. and they don't feel comfortable and then they self-sabotage. Yeah, so they actually didn't wait on purpose because they don't recognize themselves and probably don't feel that comfortable because they, their identity is being fat. Yeah, and now yeah. that they are, uh, they lost a lot of weight, like they don't recognize themselves in the mirror and they don't receive the same attention. Or in some cases, some people got fat because it was like a, a protective measure. Like uh, probably it's sad to say, but uh, some people were abused or treated very bad. So by becoming fat, they were like, um, people ignore them. And now they're receiving lots of attention and they're not used to that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely like a whole, a whole issues with uh, not only just uh, metabolism but also psychology. <laughs> so, yeah, I think uh, it's very funny, but uh, when I became uh, a coach, uh, I thought I was going to be doing, uh, you know, uh, macros and training, uh, etc. Right? Uh, that was going to be my primary job with uh, helping people. Actually, if you are a coach. Uh, you're more of a psychologist. Yeah. Like uh, the macros and the training is just the starting point, but to get it really to have real success with your clients, you have to get to know them, uh, understand what their struggles are. But it, it's more of a psychological thing. You have to help them to improve and change uh, habits, and you know to endure certain processes that are not just it is don't eat that. That's the easy part. Right. The hard part is actually leading them to change some habits and to improve their lifestyle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. So what does your own personal uh, routine look like, nutrition routine? Uh, n- Nutrition-wise, I'm very boring. Like I usually eat about the same things every day. So <laughs> uh, like either I count macros or I don't count macros. And because uh, by not counting, it means that I already eat the same thing, so I don't have to count them. Yeah. So like... Like let's say that from uh, on week weekdays, I very much eat the same. Um, so I'd say like for breakfast, I'd have like uh, three eggs and some ham and uh, avocado or some cream when I have it. Uh, spinach. I, I always try to have some green veggies. 
for lunch, uh, chicken, beef, uh, pork, uh, preferably lean parts, uh, but always uh, some of that, or salmon or tuna or uh, uh, sardines. And by dinner, I uh, either repeat lunch or breakfast. So again, some eggs or again, more uh, fish. I always try to have at least uh, two or three times a week some fish, especially their salmon or sardines. Uh, I prefer myself uh, like turkey or chicken, but I also try to have a little bit of red meat here and there. Mm -hmm. And I also try to have some uh, green vegetables for uh, nutrients. Mainly, I usually just eat um, spinach and, uh, of course, avocado and um, zucchini. Uh, here in Mexico, we have a thing called chayote, mm -hmm. which is very much like a super low carb potato that is super high on vitamin C and other nutrients so it also gives you a lot of uh, food density hmm. I'm not a big fan of, the, of dairy not because um, it's bad or something but very much because outside of uh, sour cream or we have here in Mexico very much a thing called lavne which is oh, uh, like lavne like, like Greek yogurt but it doesn't have any carbs on it I use that sporadically Mm -hmm. the outside of that I don't consume it that much because of the calories so I like to keep my calories on a set number and I'd rather have the, uh, the extra calories from the fat that comes with my meat or avocado and such um, but that's basically what I eat on a I'd say on a daily basis uh, but when I go out with friends or family or so like I just have some uh, salad with uh, with grilled meat or, or like the like and for training I follow a full body workout. I, I do power lifting and bodybuilding. So it's a called power building. Mm. But I do focus more on the Olympic lifts. So I try to, like I don't, right now I'm not doing a classic bodybuilding split where I only train one body part a day. I sort of a mix, uh, I have three routines, so I try to mix them. And I try to hit all major muscle parts at least three times a week. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sounds sounds really solid and so simple. Like keto is so simple and uh, <laughs> minimalistic. You're gonna get most of the results from just a few things. Yeah, well, very much uh, like a, uh, I'm sure you know Martin Bergham of Lean Games, right? Or Andy Morgan uh, from Rip Body. So uh, uh, I tend to talk uh, lately with uh, with Andy Morgan, and he's very much like uh, Marty. They go with uh, simple is better, and you're gonna get like ninety percent of the results that you want by doing um, the, the fewest thing possible. Like everything else is uh, details and minute. And I always see people that they obsess about the last 10% and the biggest changes from, come from doing the basics. Like yeah. if you do just squats, uh, deadlifts, bench press, uh, you do pull-ups, uh, you're probably gonna get a full body workout, especially for those that don't have that like a lot of time and you're gonna get a great physique. Okay, you're gonna. You want to go to bodybuilder and probably be a uh, get a pro card or whatever. Then probably you need to do a little bit more aesthetic work. But for ninety percent of the people that just want to look good naked, you only need like four or five exercises. All the other are probably the the top of the the cherry of the cake. You don't need to spend that much time in the gym. You don't need that much variety, especially if you are doing things on your own. And for that, it also comes into the same. Like I, I, I have a saying that I tell my clients when I see that they're overcomplicating things. It's you're on a diet, not on a culinary tour. So mm -hmm. just stick to basics. Get like how complicated can it be to get some uh, beef, uh, get some eggs, get some green vegetables, put them on a pan, salt them, and eat them. You don't need yeah. fancy recipes. You need high yeah. quality food. And if you eat that high quality food, you will not have any problem. You, you don't have to go out of your way to supplement and buy uh, uh, supplements or expensive supplements. You don't need BCAAs. You don't need, um, you know, uh, vitamins. All of that is going to be covered with high quality food. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. Like people get caught up with, oh, I'll have to, you know, meet certain expectations and uh, get get caught up in the details. So, yeah. I don't know what to do. So, like, maybe can you talk about more about the Keto Gains Bootcamp as well, where people can actually learn from you and learn yeah. the tricks of the trade in a sense? Sure. So, uh, normally we did, we started with one-on-one -on -one coaching, but uh, we found out that uh, 
like that this is an experiment I did like two years ago. Uh, people who were coaching with me also asked me a lot of the same questions and they wanted to learn from me, etc. So I did a small experiment where I had five people do the same same training because again, simple is better. So unless you want to actually uh, develop certain parts of your body, like someone who is going to actually uh, participate in a bodybuilding composition, most people will actually just need five, six exercises and improve upon them. Like that's how you become stronger. You don't need to, that much variety. You need consistency and constantly increase the weight you're lifting, right? Mm. So I did a basic program and I had these uh, persons, each one with different macros, of course, uh, but we did sort of an online bootcamp, like in a secret group on Facebook where I answered all the questions they had about uh, training, nutrition, etc. So that evolved to what the boot camps are right now, which is very much imagine like a CrossFit community in a way, where it's a mini course in uh, strength training, nutrition with an emphasis on low carb and keto and whole foods, uh, where we uh, evaluate each person as an individual and we prepare and uh, give them each one each one their macros for their particular goal, either it be fat loss or recomposition or gain uh, muscle. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, personalized, but we all follow uh, the same training uh, routine. So uh, we have three levels. Uh, novice for people who have never done any sort of strength training in their life. Then uh, beginner for people who want to have a quick workout about um, like uh, they don't want to spend that much time in the gym or have limited equipment. And then we have the intermediate advance, which is for people who have been training for quite a, a, a while, who have access to a full gym, who want to go, you know, to the next level of fitness. So what we do with uh, in, in the bootcamp is, again, we uh, evaluate the person as an individual. We give them their nutrition and their macros. We all do the same strength training program which is uh, periodized, like it's not the same. We change it week after week in one way or another. And all the while, we teach them about the basics of nutrition, the, the importance of whole foods, uh, how to create and maintain healthy dietary habits, and also how to live on, you know, in real life. It's very much different to actually tell them, eat these amounts of protein, or when you go out to, to a dinner or to a business meeting or whatever, how do you actually live the fitness lifestyle in real life. So we teach them all these tricks in a closed environment where everybody can help and support every other one in the group. So it's, again, it's very much like a mini course in nutrition with uh, training and macros, etc. So it has become extremely popular and now we're coaching over 500 persons per module. Wow. So it's, uh, <laughs> and uh, I love to say that People just don't do one bootcamp. They usually start at the novice and stay in their intermediate for at least like six to eight models. We have people who have been with us for three years now. Mm -hmm. So they do one bootcamp after another because that's also um, another strength. We don't repeat a bootcamp. Like if you, even if you do one after another, the training is totally different because it's progressive. We do change the routine uh, in one way or another. And we also experiment ourselves like, uh, we, for example, we may do one that it's just full body. Then another one, we ask the clients if they want to try a uh, bodybuilding like routine. So we, the next phase could be a bodybuilding like routine where we just train one muscle group uh, or specialize in one thing or another. Then probably we do a mock power building competition or uh, so. So we actually do change things depending on what the clients want to experiment if they're going to continue. So it's uh, it's a great thing uh, and also a great uh, way to learn the basics of nutrition in a you know in a health environment that sports people. Mm -hmm. It sounds really good and it sounds very comprehensive, and especially like if you have people you know who are staying so long. So where can people learn more about it? So they can go right now to ketogains.com or ketogainsbootcamps.com. Mm -hmm. That's uh, one way to get into our uh, newsletter or to find them more about it they are we're basically starting one in this is the second week of the new one so in four weeks in about july uh six i think we're starting the new one they last six weeks plus one week of uh rest we call it or deload mm -hmm. uh, 
and again, they go one after another. So we have like eight boot camps per year. So if they, don't, they cannot join on the start date, we can always accommodate them probably on the next one or they can reserve a space. Mm. Mm. Sounds good, yeah. And where can people learn more about you specifically if they want to contact you? Uh, yeah, also again on Keto Gains. Uh, everything that you see Keto Gains on the web is us. So it's uh, on Twitter, it's Keto Gains. On um, Instagram would be Keto Gains. If you go to Facebook, just type Keto Gains as well. We have uh, the Spanish and the English version of the group. If you prefer Spanish, you can go to Keto, Keto Gains and Espanol. <laughs> and uh, I'm also there. I'm uh, fluent in both languages. We also have a Keto Gains Spanish team. Uh, so yeah, everything that you see Keto Gains on the web is us. Awesome, awesome. Well, really enjoyed talking with you, Luis. And uh, I'm going to ask you my last question, which is, uh, what would be this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you'd adopted sooner that improved your body and your mind? Hmm. So I would say probably that's a trick question. That's a very important one. I'd say always stay hungry and, and not hungry for food, but very much for information. Mm. Like uh, not be content with what you have today, but try to improve every day on something. Uh, probably like it, it can be applied to everything. Like, yeah. to strength training, to how you did in, in your diet. Like if one day you failed, it doesn't matter. You can always improve the next day. Uh, if you fail in strength training, you can always improve the next day. If you fail with someone, you can always make up and, you know, and, and yeah. be a better person. Yeah, that's yeah, powerful advice. And I believe that that's how we also evolve as a, as a, as a, as a, as a society as well, when people try to constantly improve themselves on their individual level. So that's good advice there. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks, Louise, for coming on the podcast and I uh, really enjoyed talking with you. I'll definitely pay more attention to what's happening on the keto sphere as well with uh, keto gains and such. So, yeah, I'll see you in the Thank future. Thank you, Sam, for having me. It was a great talk. Awesome. That's it for this episode of the Body, Mind and Power podcast. If you want to support us, then I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on the iTunes or the other social media platforms. Definitely check out the show notes for the topics that we discussed in this episode. Thanks for listening. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered. Come with me if you want to lift.